Hello, welcome back. Um, we apologize for the delay, but we were having a power issue. So we shall just get on as quickly as possible with Keith Packard's talk on x.org. Okay. I actually put together two talks for the conference this year. Um, this isn't really a talk. This is supposed to be a boff. I'm trying to get uh, comments and concerns from people who are here and to uh, figure out where we should be going in terms of um, packaging and distribution and development model and get some ideas from the people who have done larger projects than even X. Uh, so today I am officially an X window system architect because I put it on my slide. And I'm actually allowed to admit that I currently work for Intel. Um, Intel has a large open source organization uh, focusing on Linux. Uh, we do uh, drivers for all of the Intel hardware. We have a, a plan of record of actually providing open source free software drivers for as much hardware as, as is used in Linux. So if you find a piece of Intel hardware that's used in a Linux environment that doesn't have a free software driver, let me know and I'll try to fix it. I've been working on that quite a bit. Okay. Uh, so this is supposed to be a boff. I wanted to tell you what we're doing, um, how we're doing it, and then I wanted to f uh, find out if there were any questions and comments from uh, people who are suffering through X right now. Um, the X development model has changed pretty dramatically in the last couple years. I wanted to tell you how, what we're doing, how we're doing things now, um, how uh, appearance is totally different from reality, as always, and uh, how you can be in involved if you want to. Um, right now, um, X.org development, we have an X.org host name, uh, the shortest one on the planet, the only single letter domain that I know of. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have control of it, active control of it. Um, the uh, X.org domain is kind of locked up in, uh, in uh, a single machine hosted at MIT. Um, so all of the X.org development is currently happening on free desktop.org because those are, those are machines that I own. And so I get to say uh, what people do with them. Uh, they're hosted at uh, Portland State University on machines donated by Google last year. Um, we, uh, the, development, the developers collaborate, as is usual, on IRC and email. Um, and it's currently, all of the development is dominated by free software people. Uh, X.org development used to be dominated by commercial Linux, uh, commercial Unix vendors, and even uh, Windows PC X server uh, developers. Um, we fixed that. Uh, we, uh, pretty much hijacked XORG development and now it's all pretty much done by friends of yours and mine, which is pretty cool. It's a major coup, I would say. Yeah. Uh, we got a bunch of uh, stuff going on. Uh, some of our key projects are, obviously we're continuing to work on the X server. It's a whole bunch of little projects going on inside there. Um, I'll talk about those in a little while. And then there's some uh, special projects that people may have heard of, uh, AIGLX and XGL I wanted to talk about the difference between those two. And then uh, some other recent work uh, in Xlib and XCB. I might as well talk about that one first. Um, Xlib was written uh, originally in 1987 and hasn't substantively changed since then except people have been hacking the bejeebus out of it. Uh, it was originally written as a single threaded library and in about 1990 people just figured out that computers were going to be multi-threaded pretty soon and so they hacked in support for multiple threads. Uh, they hacked it in in, pretty, uh, in a pretty gross way. The code was actually designed, well, semi-designed, so that threading could be implemented by replacing kind of the insides of the library and leaving all the API bits alone. Um, but instead of actually doing that and replacing the insides and leaving the API bits alone, people decided to hack the insides to support multiple threads. Uh, that turned into an utter disaster. If anybody's ever tried to run Xlib in a multi-threaded environment and actually use multiple threads to talk, to, the XR, uh, to talk through a single X connection, you'll know just how bad it is. Uh, Mozilla actually has a, an environment variable option. You can turn on uh, Xlib threading support. And uh, when you do that, uh, Mozilla locks up about two seconds after it starts. So that lets you know the state of Xlib's uh, threading support. Um, to fix that, uh, we're actually going to throw Xlib in the trash. And we have a migration plan for that. Um, it's pretty cool. We actually get to replace one of the key libraries in your system with something newer. Um, that's a great project. Uh, some students at PSU and their professor actually put together a new library called XCB, which is just an, a protocol binding. It doesn't do anything other than just map the X protocol into, user, into an application. So you have an API 
that emits protocol. It doesn't have any key code transformation. It doesn't have any event queue management. It doesn't have any input method hooks. It doesn't have any of this cruft. It's just a protocol binding. One of the cool things is the professor is a software engineering professor, and he actually formally proved the threading model in XCB correct. So uh, instead of a system which has been hacked into not working, we actually have a system which was designed to function from the get-go. Kind of a novel approach in free software. <laughs> yeah, I know. We always start with uh, dev null and start typing until it, uh, until it uh, does what we want and stop when it does. In this case, they actually started with uh, a Z formal proof of correctness. So that's actually worked out pretty well. Uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the difference between AIGLX and XGL. Um, how many of you have heard of AIGLX or XGL? How many of you have ever actually tried to run uh, XGL? Ooh, <laughs> a stunning two people. <laughs> yeah, okay, Enrico has seen it actually running on somebody else's machine. Massive display corruption. Okay, XGL is getting a, a f an excellent reputation for quality and, uh, and supportability. I love that. It's great. Um, XGL is an X server written in GL, uh, which is to say that it's just a regular X server and the entire back end just uses the GL API for all graphics. Um, it's, a neat, it's a neat idea. It was one I thought originally would be uh, well received by the maintainers and developers of the closed source GL drivers, uh, which I thought was a pretty neat hack um, and I thought would be a good way of reducing our overall code maintenance. Um, it turns out that it's actually not as huge a win as I thought it would be. Uh, one of the advantages that GL offers today for a GL driver developer is that the API doesn't have any guarantees for pixelization on the screen, which is to say, if it looks good, it is good, which is generally a pretty good plan for a graphic system. I mean, looks is really what you're after here. You're not interested in exact mathematical accuracy. Um, and as a result, GL implementations have huge fudges all over the place. It's like, well, this doesn't get quite the right answer or exactly what you would expect it to do, but it looks the same, or it looks as good, or sometimes it looks better. Uh, for instance, we now have anisotropic uh, anti-aliasing in a lot of environments. We didn't used to have that. GL didn't really even advertise that for a long time. And implementation said, well, this is pretty easy to do in hardware now. Let's implement it, even though it's not in the spec, and make it the default and see what people say. So here you have technology advancing ahead of the specification um, and able to do that because the specification doesn't rigidly define what it does. Well, in contrast, the X specification says precisely what pixel values are going to appear on the screen. Does anybody think this is a good idea? We have one person who still thinks precise pixelization is a good idea. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> and the whole crowd stands against you. Um, precise pixelization was an interesting idea. It was the idea that you could actually come up with um, um, uh, functions that specified exactly what you wanted to uh, appear on the screen and that by doing so it would be easy to implement because you knew exactly what you were supposed to do um, and it would be very easy to test. That was one of the key benefits of precise pixelization. It was easy to test. Um, it turns out that people want to do different things and in particular they want to cheat with their hardware. Uh, they want to make things go faster. They want to not worry so much about exactly the content of the screen and they want to be able to implement things in a wide variety of different ways. For instance, most 3D hardware doesn't use a Bresenham uh, algorithm for the edges of polygons. They use DDAs. DDAs are a lot faster because there's no feedback required to implement a DDA. It's just simple add. Um, and as a result, a lot of 3D hardware uses DDAs for uh, polygon rasterization, or at least used to. I don't know what it still does. Um, the problem is you can't use a DDA if you ha your specification says Bresenham and you say it has to match exactly because occasionally you get the wrong answer. Well, even though it goes 10 times faster, you can't use it, which means that a lot of X implementations are dog slow for any actual graphics like lines or polygons because they have to follow the specification exactly. Well, so getting back to XGL. So one of the problems with XGL is that it's trying to implement the X specification, which is a fixed pixelization specification on top of a very fluid library. And the developers of the GL library were kind of, were kind of in a quandary. It's like, well, they really want to be able to mutate the GL library and change what it draws in the screen. And yet, in order to support XGL, they have to provide some level of guarantee of pixelization. Not a great plan. The XGL API, the GL API is also enormous. There's a bazillion functions and a lot of code that implements it. And 
saying that X is implemented on top of GL is equivalent to saying that the entire GL API can now be used by the X server, which is to say that your X server can use any piece of the GL API at any time which to a GL implementer says that in order to provide pr precise pixelization, all of a sudden the entire GL API now has to be fixed in some re relationship to the X server implementation. As the X server implementation isn't constrained to a subset of the GL API, all of a sudden your entire GL API becomes a part of your X server. And so the people who implement closed source GL drivers were, say, were uh, actually kind of terrified by this notion that all of a sudden their entire GL API was going to be exposed and required to be constant over time so that people could implement X servers on top of it. Um, the goal of XGL is different from the implementation. The goal of XGL is to get us away from using the tiny little corner of your graphics hardware that implements 2D functionality. The goal was to take over the other 95% of your graphics chip that implements 3D functionality today and use that to accelerate your X server. Well, there's the obvious way to do that, the way that we thought about it originally, was to use, just use the GL driver and use the GL API. There's an, another simpler method, and that is to use the 3D hardware from your 2D driver. You just use exact, you implement a subset of a 3D-like driver using the 3D hardware that implements the 2D operations that you need. Alternatively, um, you can use bits and pieces of the GL API to accelerate pieces of the X server and then use um, direct hardware rendering for other pieces of the X server. So in other words, you can write a driver specific, a GL driver specific uh, 2D driver that uses GL functions for some of its operations and then uses direct register writes for other operations. And that's where AIGLX really comes in. AIGLX is uh, an acronym for the Accelerated Indirect GLX Project. Um, the original open source GL implementation called Mesa was ported to 3D hardware in about 1999 uh, by uh, then Precision Insight, now Tungsten Graphics. Um, they actually implemented direct rendering, um, uh, direct rendering infrastructure where you could accelerate GL to 3D hardware inside a Windows system, inside X in particular. And the way that they did that was they had all the GL commands go straight to the GL API and directly to the hardware, and then the driver would communicate with the X server over which pieces of the screen it was supposed to draw to. So the, the X server had, in effect, almost nothing to do with the, the direct rendering uh, GL driver. All that it was doing was sitting there telling the GL library what piece of the screen the window that you were drawing to appeared on and when it moved. It was a pretty simple architecture. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty complicated architecture, although it was simple, uh, simple in, in, uh, in principle. Um, the problem was is that when you had a network connection and you didn't, didn't have direct access to the hardware, there was no way to accelerate rendering because the X server didn't know about GL. All the X server knew about was where the windows were on the screen. So when you talked over a network, X was, uh, GL was really slow. Accelerated indirect GLX, what it does is it takes that accelerated GL driver and sticks it inside the X server so that when you talk to the X server over the network and send GL commands over the network, they can be accelerated. It's a really simple sounding change and in fact the direct rendering infrastructure had always in theory supported it but nobody had ever bothered to implement it. Well, why did we do it now? You know, why this sudden change? We had direct rendering. Games were running plenty fast. People were pretty happy with how, how things were working. Why is accelerated indirect GLX all of a sudden interesting? It's interesting precisely for the same reason that XGL is interesting. It's interesting because um, accelerated indirect GLX gives you the combination of X and GL rendering in the same package. All of a sudden, your GL rendering um, can, be, uh, can communicate with X objects. Before, GL rendering and, and X rendering were entirely separate. You had the GL world and you had the X world, and the only place they intersected was in the frame buffer when the pixels actually went out to the DAC and out to the screen. Otherwise, there was no communication. So when we started looking at composited window systems where the, windows are, are, the contents of windows are manipulated by an external application, and you start talking about how do you manipulate the contents of windows that contain GL graphics, and how do you manipulate the contents of Windows with GL graphics? All of a sudden, you, the X and GL overlap becomes much more obvious, right? All of a sudden, the objects that you're manipulating with GL are the same as the objects you're ma manipulating with X. You're manipulating window contents, and you're, ma you're manipulating the fundamental frame buffer, and you're starting to merge them together. 
In the direct rendering infrastructure that we have today, there's no way to communicate between these two worlds. The object sets are totally discrete. And in fact, the memory allocation in your frame buffer with uh, any of the free software drivers today actually splits the video card right down the middle and says, okay, X gets half and GL gets half. And they never communicate about the contents of the memory. Which means that you can't talk about a GL object from an X application, or you can't talk about an X object using the GL API. Accelerated indirect GL and uh, XGL both merge those two worlds so that you can communicate about X objects with GL API and you can communicate about GL objects with the X API. In particular, both of them implement a new extension called Texture from PixMap, which is to say we take a texture I mean an X pix map or an X window contents or any X object and we convert it into a GL texture. All of a sudden now you have the first integration between these two worlds of uh, the two uh, object sets. You can manipulate X contents with GL and that's exactly what XGL does and that's exactly what uh, the new Metacity hacks are doing in terms of GL based compositing managers. They're taking X content and manipulating it with the GL API. So all the glitz that you see in the Compiz demos, all the glitz that you see in the Red Hat uh, AIGLX demos, those are all using this very simple notion of being able to take X contents and manipulate them with GL and that's where all the whiz bang comes from. So it's one tiny little extension that implements one tiny little function and you get all this huge, huge leverage. Now why do we need to do this with AIGLX? Why can't we do this with DRI? Well in the DRI world, remember, the frame buffer is split down the middle, GL gets half, X gets half and they can't communicate. With AIGLX you have one process that can actually communicate with those two object sets. You have the X server that knows about all the X objects and all of a sudden it also talks to the direct rendering infrastructure so it knows about the GL objects. So the AIGLX actually physically copies the contents from one, set of the, one part of the frame buffer to another to move the contents of the X, uh, of the, uh, X pix map into a uh, texture object. XGL implements this in a slightly different way. In the XGL world, all of the pix maps in your server are already textures. So texture from pix map in the GL world, in the XGL world is really simple. It just says, oh, those are the same object. So now we have, this, we have tied the semantics of these two systems together in this one simple extension. So they're functionally exactly the same in terms of the glitz you can provide to the screen. How are they different? XGL is an X server implemented on top of GL. It is not a standalone X server at all. Where does the GL, what does a GL implementation on our X server require today? It requires an X server because GL doesn't have any way to configure the frame buffer mode selection, it doesn't have any way to do memory, this initial memory partitioning, it doesn't have any way to manipulate a cursor on the screen. So XGL today requires that another X server be running on your machine. So if you run XGL, you actually first start X and then you start XGL. So you can imagine the resource consumption issues in this environment, especially because X splits the frame buffer memory in half. And XGL uses no X objects. It's strictly a GL based application. So you've already lost half of your frame buffer memory just by starting XGL. Plus you have to configure and manage an entirely, two entirely separate X servers. You have to configure X, the underlying X server, and then you have to configure XGL on top of it. So this is layering, you know, complexity. Um, so it looks like XGL today is a really cool demo because it de demonstrates what you can do with GL-based compositing. It was easy to put together, didn't require any, any cooperation among giant entities in terms of what the uh, hardware abstractions were going to look like. It just used the GL API to provide it a lot of interesting bling. Um, but it looks like today, like a more, a more rational approach to this is to move in an AIGLX fashion where we can take the functionality of the X server and the functionality of GL and get them integrated today in terms of hardware support in a single X server and then moved in the future to moving uh, more additional functionality uh, into the GL API. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, in the AI GLX world, what have we done? We've got the GL API embedded in the X server so that we can accelerate all of this indirect uh, GL calls. What is, the additional, uh, what is an additional advantage of this environment? Well, one of the cool things you can do now is all of a sudden the X server can make GL calls. It doesn't have to be in response to GL uh, requests by applications. It can be in response to whatever it wants to do. So if you want to accelerate some operation and your driver says, oh, I already accelerate that with my GL API, well, that's pretty cool. 
we have an accelerated uh, operation through GL. Instead of duplicating the implementation and doing that again in the 2D world, we can just call the GL functions from the driver. So I get all the same advantages of the XGL world in terms of being able to take advantage of the, G the GL implementation that we have, plus I get all the advantage of the existing X world where I get to incrementally refine the system and improve it over time so that it does what we want. And I don't have this sudden jump from the one X server to two X servers with the goal of eventually eliminating the underlying X server. It's a, more, it's a smoother migration path. The end, end result for both of these products is exactly the same. We have an X server that Im is implemented largely in terms of the GL API that is a standalone, uh, uh, runs standalone on the hardware. Okay, I think I have more slides here. Um, another status report item um, about, oh, I don't know, about five years ago, we started modularizing the X window system. It's traditionally been implemented as a giant ball of source code. And that when you get a release, you got the tarball from hell. It had everything in it, applications, libraries, X server, documentation, specifications, fonts, everything, all in one giant tarball. So if you look at the old Debian packaging for X, it had about, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 packages, binary packages, that all came from the same source package. So when anything in that source package changed, what did we ship? Oh, we shipped about 50 or 60 new binary packages which meant that every time you made a small change in X, you got this huge download bolus from every single, every single Debian user and from every single Red Hat user and SUSE user. Everybody got to up, update their entire systems every, th every time anything even uh, changed in a small way. Um, we did 7.0 last year. Uh, that was the last monolithic release. Uh, because it was joined at the hip with 6.9. We wanted to do two releases that kind of synchronized the code base before we dived off in this modular way. Um, this next month, this month? Soon, I don't know, weeks, not months. Um, we're gonna do a 7.1 release, and this is the, old, the first standalone modular release. It's kind of the first acid test of whether our plans are gonna work, because it's not done in modular form which is to say the packages that we're putting together for this modular release really are totally independent and released independently before the modular, the roll-up Katamari release is made. So we're taking all these little tiny packages, most of which haven't changed, and we're gonna roll them up into a big release. So when those d get dumped into Debian and it moves forward to 7.1, essentially all that happens is a lot of existing packages that haven't changed get rebranded. Right, all of a sudden there are, there are 7.1. Now what Debian has done, the Debian X maintainers have done, is they've actually switched the numbering system over from this 6.9, 7.0 numbering system to the underlying package numbers. All right, so you see X server uh, 1.02 uh, right now. I don't remember the exact uh, version number. So when, um, when we roll this stuff and you get a new version of X, you'll note that things like X mod map, which haven't changed since 7.0, there is no new package for that. The package that's included in 7.1 is exactly the same as the package that was included in 7.0 with the same version number. So Debian won't roll that package at all for this transition. The only thing it's gonna roll over are the packages that are different. Um, it's supposed to be, I don't know when Ajax said he was gonna get it done, but it's, it's gonna be pretty soon. He's been rolling version numbers of a couple of other packages that have changed. Um, the cool part is that now that Debian's at 7.0, the 7.1 transition is going to be a piece of cake. Really, they'll do it soon. Anybody remember the, the great, uh, how long did it take 18 months to move to some x 3 d 6 release? It was like the 4.1 release took like 18 months or so. Yeah, I hope to never see that happen again. Uh, the cool part is quick fixes are now possible. It's really easy for any Debian developer to say, oh, I need to fix my video driver. It used to be the way that you'd fix your video driver is you'd download <laughs> the entire X source code and you'd rebuild the whole thing and you'd get 50 new binary packages and you think, oh, cool, now what do I do? Well, today, it's really easy. I actually demoed this a couple days ago. BDL had a trouble with his laptop. The TV out wasn't working quite right. I mean, the video playback wasn't working quite right. And on an airplane flight, everybody knows what's the most important application video playback. <laughs> so both as a favor to BDL, who uh, offered to, has always done cool things for me, um, and as a test of whether the modularization system was working, I decided to fix this bug, because I already had the fix in my own source code. Um, so all I had to do was get two uh, do two apt commands, 
first to get the source for the video driver and then to get all the build depths for the video driver. I hacked the source for the video driver and I de-builded it and bang, I had a .dev and I sent it off to him. It took about you know five minutes to download the necessary packages and about two minutes to do the build and all of a sudden he had an updated dev and he had his bug fixed. So this is actually working. We have a demonstration of the modularization system helping BDL watch his movies on the airplane. <laughs> of course, I sent him uh, a binary of the driver that I had built on my machine not using the system because I didn't know that it would be this easy. So he actually got two giant blobs of stuff in the mail. Yeah, of course, one uses the .deb because it's way easier to install. Okay, uh, so what's coming in, I'm gonna ch just check the time here. Uh, what's coming in 7.1, uh, AIGLX is included, uh, XGL is included as well, uh, so you can play with either of those technologies. Um, there is a change in the driver ABI, so every single video driver is going to get revved for this, uh, this release. Uh, this is the first time we changed the driver, intentionally changed the driver ABI. <laughs> yeah, everybody's laughing. It, it used to be that the driver ABI would get accidentally changed. Somebody would make a commit to some file, and it's like, oh, about six months later, you'd notice, oh, all of the old binary drivers don't work anymore. Well, why didn't we notice this before this? You know, why did it take six months to figure it out? Well, it's because we had a monolithic release. And when you touched a header file and typed make, it would rebuild all the parts of the system that depended upon that header file which means if you change the driver ABI, then all of your drivers would recompile automatically. It's like, ooh, this is cool. I don't have to worry about dependencies because Make figures it out for me. Well, cool for you, the developer, not so cool for the, the poor schlep, the user, who got a new X server binary but did not get a new driver because nobody noticed the drivers changed. Nothing was changed in the driver itself. And so the, the poor schlep gets a new X server but not a new driver and it doesn't work. It's like, well, what happened? Well, the ABI changed but nobody noticed. Well, for 7.1, we actually intentionally changed it. So instead of the normal thing where every release changes the ABI and you get all new drivers on accident, this time the ABI changed on purpose and everybody gets new drivers. <laughs> so yeah, we, at least we know ahead of time it's going to change. Um, we did a bunch of little fixes that were uh, kind of pending. Um, NVIDIA had a couple of fixes we wanted to do. Uh, composite needed a new fix so that XV could work in a composite environment. So you could watch your movies in a composite environment and have translucent movies. So you could watch more than one at a time. <laughs> What's the technical term for watching more than one movie at once in translucent, in translucent mode? That would be called orgy mode. <laughs> yeah. So we're hoping to be able to actually implement some translucent video stuff. And I actually have an updated Intel driver uh, that I'm working on, that actually I'm making my minion work on, uh, that has uh, the ability to do textured video. So I should be able to uh, demo multiple, multiple video playback uh, in a couple days. He did it in a weird spot though. Okay, um, I work for Intel today. Uh, why do I work there? Uh, well, Intel is the only driver, of, uh, the only provider of video drivers right now that supports their own video hardware with free software drivers. And uh, Intel has done that since the i810. Um, uh, since uh, Intel has a corporate policy of providing free software drivers for its hardware, and the chipset group has been uh, actually contracting out this work to Tungsten Graphics for the, since, since days of yore, since the i810. So Intel has been paying an external entity to do the uh, i810 driver, and they've been doing a pretty good job. Um, obviously, their goals and Intel's goals aren't exactly in a line, so the drivers had some, some rough spots occasionally. Um, we're working at Intel now to actually pull some of that development in-house and do more of the work and more of the refinement and release management of that driver actually from uh, using Intel staff so we can actually get a better, uh, better handle on distribution integration, driver quality management, testing, documentation, that kind of stuff. Um, so we're working on some, a couple of new projects right now. Um, we're working on switching the Intel driver. How many of you have an Intel, uh, Intel graphics chip on their laptops? Yeah, quite a few. How many of you uh, do not have a BIOS that knows about the native screen size on your panel? In other words, how many of you, how many of you are using 855 resolution hacks today? Yeah, a bunch. Well, 
The cool part about the BIOS is the BIOS knows how big your panel is. There's a little table there that has a panel configuration in it, knows exactly how big it is. And Windows uses that to find out how big the panel is to know how to set the appropriate mode. But what Windows doesn't use is the other part of the BIOS that actually does the mode setting. There's actually BIOS calls, and if you've ever used um, the Visa FB dev driver uh, for, um, for uh, the kernel, you'll note that you can set you know, arbitrary graphics modes from the, uh, from the kernel. Well, the kernel does this using code in your BIOS to set the video modes. It just says, oh, Mr. BIOS, please set a random video mode. Well, these days, Windows doesn't use that code. Any bets on how well tested and supported the BIOS mode selection code is in uh, most laptops these days? Yeah, it's never been run. So all of you who are suffering with 855 uh, resolution right now, whatever that, nine, what is the name of that program? Is that, yeah. All of you who are suffering with that right now are suffering because Windows doesn't use that code anymore. Windows use, goes direct to the hardware. The Intel driver is the only driver today that uses the BIOS for its primary and sole mode of mode selection. Why does it do that? Well, it does that because the Intel chip itself doesn't talk to most of the output devices on your laptops. Anything before the 915 chipset, like 855, 845, 810, there's no laptop support in that chip. Does this seem insane to you? You have a mobile chipset that can't actually talk to your panel. Um, well, okay, so it's a little crazy. What they do is instead they have this little dongle on the side called, uh, that talks to, uh, through a channel called DVO. And so there's this external chip, not made by Intel, that you have to program to get to talk to the LVDS, uh, the, the local, local panel stuff, or TV out, or external DVI, or all this kind of stuff. The only thing the 855 supported was VGA, or this DVO stuff. So the problem is there's a bunch of the external chips and they are programmed in slightly different ways. So the Intel driver used the BIOS because the BIOS was supposed to know how to program this thing for the panel. Turn out it didn't. Um, but a laptop manufacturer would just say, oh, Mr. External Chip Vendor, please tell us how to program your chip. And they would hack the driver for the laptop that they were shipping for Windows so that it would know how to program the chip that was in the laptop to get it to work. So the reason the Intel driver didn't use direct register programming was because it, we didn't have the, uh, the tungsten graphics, didn't want to spend the money and time necessary to have uh, drivers for all these external chips. Well, we're going to bite the bullet and actually implement drivers for all these external chips and uh, provide, of course, source code for it. Um, so we're hoping to be able to get, we're hoping to be able to get some uh, uh, reasonable stuff working in the near future. If you have a 915 or a 945 chip today, that we have a driver that works on those chips. Or if you're talking to a VGA spigot, the driver will work on older chips as well. But 855, 845 with DVO output, that's not working yet. But we hope it had that working in a couple months. So this is not gonna be included in 7.1 because it's not done yet. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about was source code management. Um, X has, been, X has had a long history of a variety of different source code management systems. Um, of course, before 1986, it was the usual source code management system of, oh, we had a backup yesterday, and let me see what changed from yesterday by restoring the backup and doing a diff. Um, not such a great system. That was in the 1985 era. Um, for X, X11, we started using RCS for our source code management, which was pretty cool, because you could actually like, uh, you know, see what changed between different files. It was pretty cool. Yeah, in about 1993, 1992, something like that, uh, switched over to, no, <laughs> worse than that. In 1994, they switched over to ClearCase, the source motel. Your code checks in, but it never checks out. <laughs> <laughs> X386 wisely decided not to use uh, a closed source nightmare source code system like ClearCase and use CVS. Um, so we have a bunch of, we have a wide variety of different source code repositories. RCS, ClearCase, CVS, the usual adventure. Um, so right now our development is largely done in CVS, um, but I got sick of CVS because it's slow and buggy. And so I decided to switch to the Git. And so I switched Xlib over to the Git one day and sent mail and said, oh, by the way, Xlib development is now done in the Git. And I got the kind of underwhelming response from the community. They said, what the hell? 
And I said, oh yeah, you guys didn't know that I've been looking at the Git for about six months. <laughs> I guess I forgot to tell you, oops. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of a forcing function at this point. It's like I'm just moving more and more stuff from CVS to the Git. I had to write a new uh, Git, uh, CVS to Git conversion tool because the available ones weren't sophisticated enough to handle uh, Zorg CVS repositories with their interesting history. Uh, so I actually have a pretty stable tool that will, that will take, so that's a kind of additional side benefit, right? Oops, giant itch to scratch, new tool developed. So now I can actually uh, transition pretty sophisticated CVS repositories to the Git in a lossless fashion. Um, I think I could probably take that same tool and uh, import CVS repositories into Mercurial or uh, BZR or anything else like that. It'd be interesting to see. The main challenges of this, of this tool are not interfacing with an existing or, I mean, a modern SCM. They're entirely in figuring out what happened with CVS. So it'd be interesting to see if I could take that tool and actually uh, take CVS stuff to BZR or um, Mercurial. It'd be interesting to see if that would work. Uh, so I'm hoping to finish this transi transition this year. Um, probably stale stuff will just stay in CVS because until people change it, it doesn't have to move. So we're going to have a mixture probably for the coming years of uh, CVS and the Git as uh, people move stuff over. And if uh, people try to move stuff to the other, other SCM, I'll smack them. Uh, not because I think other ones are bad, uh, but because having more than one for a project is probably a bad idea. Uh, so that's the end of my stuff. Uh, people have comments and questions? Oh, we have the microphone runners who are now select selecting who gets to talk. Will you think, will you think that I don't appreciate the, uh, the driver that you provided through Tungsten Graphics if I ask you this question? The last programmer's reference manual from Intel for the integrated graphics 830 is uh, 845 and 915 and 945 and all that. Is it? Or if it's not, can you comment? Okay, yeah, documentation for Intel graphics. Um, the reason that Intel doesn't provide documentation right now is that it costs money to publish documents in, uh, in an external form. It's the only reason. There's no intrinsic, uh, intrinsic desire not to publish documentation. The chipset group has, doesn't have a very strong motivation to do the support. It's required to provide free software drivers, but I mean, frankly, their, their key focus is in the Windows market. By moving the driver development in-house, to, to an o the open source part of Intel, one of our goals is actually to be able to help them with the process of preparing documentation for external consumption. So I can't promise anything, but one of our, one of our uh, we have uh, five or six open recs for technical writers in our group whose sole job will be to take Intel tech technical documentation and prepare it for publication. So I'm hoping, but nothing's happening yet. Another question? Is it on? Sort of standard and universally available. How does that stack us up against um, Vista <laughs> and OS X in terms of the malleability and the, the flexibility of the underlying Windows display mechanism? In terms of the graphics capabilities, the question was how, how well does yeah, I was working on it. Yeah, uh, he, um, Mark asked the the uh, if we do if we provide AI GLX, how close do we get to the capabilities of Vista and uh, and OS X? And the answer is, in a graphical sense, we're there. We have a GL based uh, graphical environment that fully provides ex uh, as much acceleration as you can ever possibly want. Uh, from the hardware as long as GL keeps advancing. From a configuration and customization perspective, we're not even close in terms of the ability to switch monitor outputs, the ability to support TV out, the ability to have, do hot plugging of monitors and input devices, we get a lot of work to do yet. But AIGLX gets us closer to the graphic output piece and doesn't hinder our ability to, um, to innovate in these other areas. So it's a piece of the puzzle. Is is there um, much point into moving so much stuff to using GL when such a large part of graphics hardware has a proprietary drivers still today? And it seems that the two main manufacturers are still not willing to provide uh, open source drivers. Well, that's another one of my secret plans working at Intel. Um, the, two main, the, the, the two main manufacturers you talk about, ATI and NVIDIA, actually currently provide less than half of the uh, chips used in desktop 
Linux systems today. Uh, Intel, oh, Intel, the, Intel's fraction of that particular market segment is pretty significant. It's well north of 50% today. Uh, my, one of my goals in pushing the quality of the Intel graphics drivers and helping push the quality of Intel graphics hardware is to make it clear that you can have free software drivers and help the, and help the Linux market grow and that if you want to play effectively in this market, you have to play by the rules. So I'm hoping to encourage ATI and NVIDIA by example into providing free software drivers for their hardware. Um, but in terms of moving more functionality to GL, um, NVIDIA in particular has actually been doing a pretty good job of supporting their hardware with drivers. Uh, their drivers, they have 7.1 drivers available today. So even if you're stuck with a binary driver, at least it works. I'm not saying it works beautifully at all hardware. Uh, and in particular, laptops are not very well supported. Um, but um, they're already using a lot of the 3D hardware in their 2D driver. So G AI GLX provides us a way to use GL or GL-like stuff for acceleration of particular drivers. It doesn't force driver authors to use GL for particular acceleration. So where NVIDIA has 2D acceleration for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, new stuff, the new graphics that require or encourage the use of 3D graphics, um, they're going directly to their hardware today, and that's still possible. It's just additional engineering effort for them. So, yeah, like I say, I'm trying to encourage them to providing documentation and source code for their chipsets by demonstrating that a significant fraction of the Linux market is unwilling to use closed source drivers. So that's my real goal. That was, that's one of my uh, real goals of working at Intel. It's not to make Intel graphics better. It's to make the Linux desktop better. What will happen with people that have old video cards that don't have 3D support once XGL is the standard server? Well, as I said, I'm hoping not to, not to have XGL as the standard server. That's one of the advantages of staying with our traditional model and adding the ability to accelerate particular drivers with GL operations. It means that existing X server operations can continue to use the 2D parts of the hardware where, it's, where that's the only thing available. And so your applications will continue to work as they do today, and we won't have this sudden performance drop if people switch to a new X server. So this, the X server, what AIGLX offers is the potential to use GL to accelerate operations for hardware that supports it. It doesn't require that you have a fully functional GL implementation to have a high performance X server. You can still have an X server that goes straight to the hardware and goes as fast as it does today. Of course, as applications start using fancier and fancier features, older hardware is going to be harder and harder to support, but there's not a lot I can do about that other than encourage people to make sure that their applications don't depend upon them. In particular, the, the glitz that you see in things like uh, Compiz or some of the AIGLX based uh, GL compositing managers, none of that's required to run applications. It just, it's just prettier. Uh, about the only thing we have now that is required is the ability to do um, any alias text and that dramatically improves, improves the quality of the uh, presentation on the screen and doesn't, um, doesn't actually take a huge amount of CPU to do even in software. Yes, I see the time sign. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the plan again is to make sure that old hardware can use to work as well as it does today. Uh, a guy named Jonas on IRC asks, is there any chance that Intel will release graphic cards so the free graphics drivers can be used on non-Intel machines such as AMD 64? I don't, I can't really say anything about Intel's hardware plans, even if I knew anything, so. His name was Jonas Meyer, by the way. Yep. I have a second question. Uh, is there any work going on about XDMCP to make it uh, use less network so that it works faster? Oh, uh, using X over the network. Yeah. Um, we aren't doing anything inside X.org right now, but of course NX has done a bunch of work in that. Um, I did a bunch of research uh, a couple of years ago to try to figure out why X was slow over the network. And using X raw over the network, even with compression, um, the network traffic doesn't turn out to be a performance problem for X. The only real performance problem is latency. If you run S, X over SSH, it's pretty compressed. It doesn't take a huge amount of a network bandwidth, and it's actually pretty usable. Um, one of the things we need to add to X is uh, some loss, lossy image compression, so you can transmit images to the X server without sucking bandwidth. And maybe we'll do that. Other question? How about 
Oh, the integration of, uh, the question was about whether we're going to integrate NX into X a little more tightly. I don't really have any particular plans on that. Right now, X works, NX works pretty well as an external agent. Um, and it does a lot of external caching to disk, which means that I certainly don't want it integrated into my X server, which runs as root. Uh, so having it as an external agent seems like a nice security uh, policy right now. So I, it doesn't seem to need to be integrated. Why would we integrate it? And it's working pretty well as a standalone project. Um, would it be an idea to uh, add some functionality to the X server that allows for a limited interactive response without, without consulting the application about everything? For example, if I hover the mouse over a button, the application needs, uh, needs to uh, highlight the button if it wants to do so. Oh, in terms of, okay, so the question is about restructuring things so that we have actual uh, interaction built into the X server. Um, a bunch of people have tried that in different windowing environments. If you've ever seen the Sun News windowing system, uh, the problem is, is that it actually requires the developer to become a network protocol developer as well. And because your application is now split between the server where the interaction is occurring and it obviously has to be programmable, and the client where the uh, application uh, intelligence operates. So you have to be able to program the X server with some programming language. You have to develop a custom network protocol that communicates those interactions to the application. And now you have to write an application in a separate language. So to do application development in that environment, you have to do three things. You have to develop a network protocol. You have to program in the X server customization language, whether that be PostScript or Scheme or Nickel. And then you have to write your application in C or C++ or Java. It's a huge effort for application developers to undertake. And I haven't ever seen a system successfully implemented in that model. It'd be cool if they could, but. Uh, I see it mainly as a toolkit problem. Most, most of the toolkits are already handle things like, uh, well, doing the highlighting of buttons the mouse uh, hovers over or deactivating other radio buttons. This is, this is the kind of uh, interact uh, this is the level of interactivity I would like to see in the X server to have a responsive uh, user interface uh, even, in, uh, even if, uh, if the network is a bit, a bit laggy. Like I say, the problem is, is that now you have to program the X server. Yeah, it's a toolkit problem. No, it's not a toolkit problem. It's an application developer problem. Yeah. I, I think we're almost out of time. We can take one more comment or question. Is there any way to uh, extend X in such a way that you can disconnect and reconnect sessions? Such as oh, actually, session disconnection, reconnection. That's a good question. I wish I had a lot more time. Repeat the question. <laughs> oh, I got a nice, they have signs for everything these days. Uh, the question is about session disconnection and reconnection, application disconnection and reconnection. There are actually proxies right now that support that. Uh, the problem is, 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 is that um, there's a bunch of state in the X server that uh, if, you, if the connection is severed um, abruptly, you can't recover from. The, uh, the particular state in question is PixMap contents. Um, if an, an, uh, right now, you can't transparently fix applications to handle uh, the, the network disappearing, so the connection to the X server disconnecting suddenly. Uh, because the applications expect PixMap contents to persist across connections. That's the only state we have right now that we can't recover. Um, and so fixing applications to be able to, to recover, toolkits to be able to recover from that would mean we could do this without a proxy X server in the middle, which is what people do today. They put a little proxy X server that holds the PixMap contents and, and, uh, and replays the PixMaps uh, when the connection is reconstructed, but we can't do that yet today. So the, an extension that would allow for PixMaps to be damaged re and restored would be nice. And that's, I think that's all we need. I've seen a demonstration of uh, this happening with GTK, and it's quite transparent to GTK applications. There's a GTK application that calls the API, and basically it allows you to just detach <coughs> different applications. Sure, the, the problem with the GTK API is that it requires that the um, X server be disconnected gracefully. And so anything that requires a graceful disconnect from the X server is not very interesting to me because the real question is, how do you recover from a network failure? I think that's the, the most interesting question. So yeah, I mean, you can do it today gracefully. You just can't do it uh, in, the, in the failure cases. Um, how will things like XCB interact with, uh, with uh, NX and other sort of protocol optimization extensions for, uh, or proxies for X? 
I'm hoping that XCB will actually improve NX, uh, NX performance, although NX has actually been pretty carefully tuned to completely eliminate the dependence upon latency by um, proxying a significant portion of the application state um, onto the client side of the wire. So in, in, in effect, I don't think XCB will, will make NX worse, but I don't think it will make it significantly better either. I think, I think we're uh, up for time today. Um, I have another session tomorrow. If you have more questions, I can talk less tomorrow, and we, uh, we can uh, continue on with this discussion then. Thanks so much.